And D&D is also, and this came from an article, but it is considered the game that jump-started modern role-playing games. And it's also influenced mm. most of the video games that we play today. So well, yeah, it's kind, it kind of revolutionized everything. I was going to say, when you said it's an RPG, like uh, how many games that you play like, on your Xbox the or your Harry PlayStation yeah. are RPG games? Mm -hmm. And you don't even realize that like this maybe kickstarted a lot of that. Yeah. it's And it's really the same. It's very, very similar, except instead of you like – playing online with controller you're acting it out a little bit except you're not running around you're just like sitting at the table and acting it out And hello, Bee Critics fam. Welcome to another episode of the Bee Critics podcast. So this week's movie is one of the more underrated movies of 2023, in my opinion. Um, I think at face value, everyone thought it was really niche. It also came out the week before the Super Mario Bros. movie. So like that was a thing. Um, but it's an action, action adventure comedy and it's based on a super popular Hasbro game. And if you haven't guessed it by now, we are talking <laughs> about Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, Dragons which I think a lot of people would agree with you that it's highly underrated. Yeah. I think it's because the John Wick movie came out like the week before and yep. then the, like you said, Super Mario Bros. came out mm -hmm. the week after. So it's like, it's well liked by critics, but mm -hmm. it kind of tanked a little bit in the box office. It flew under the radar big time. And people, yes. even people who like movies, I'll be like, They'll be like, oh, like, what was your favorite movie 2023? And I'm like, well, I really liked the Dungeons and Dragons movie. And they're like, oh, really? Favorite movie haven't of seen 2023? It. I said, I really liked it. Uh, that was your first <laughs> answer. I, I, I have wonder not what decided. you're decided. I have not decided my favorite of 2023 as yet. Mm -hmm. But mine's also an action adventure seen. movie. So it's I a get good the one. Vibe. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm excited to talk about it because this is my first time watching it. <laughs> Okay, so in a far off land, a merry band of thieves is on an adventure, a quest to rec rescue a princess and stop a bad guy. Well, kind of. <laughs> Edgen, Holga, Simon, and Doric are on a campaign to reunite Edgen with his daughter, Kyra, and expose the Lord of Neverwinter for the lying con man he is. But there's more to this story, because isn't there always? Basically, they have to find the Helmet of Disjunction, break into the Lord's vault to confiscate to confiscate his riches, rescue Kyra, and sail off into forever. But there's a catch. The Lord is in cahoots with a very dark force that threatens the lives of the people of Neverwinter. So naturally, the, demon, the team is faced with a decision. Run off with the rich, riches or turn back to save the people of Neverwinter. To do so, they must sacrifice their lives and all the riches they so desperately wanted. So what will they choose? A lifetime supply of wealth or a lifetime supply of pride in doing the right thing? Perhaps they can have both. Okay, so as I was watching this movie, there's a lot going on. We've got Neverwinter, we've got a lot of characters, we've got this helmet of disjunction, we've got like a lot of yeah. people, a lot of places, uh -huh. like a little confusing, but I think mm -hmm. I was able to follow most of it. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking like throughout the watch because I feel like Chris Pine gives a lot of like Chris P Pratt energy and <laughs> I feel like I was like kind of watching like Guardians of the Galaxy a little bit like very uh -huh. different in the sense of like this one was a little bit more like Game of Thrones-esque mm -hmm. yeah. but, but very similar in that they were like making quips and jokes the whole time mm -hmm. yeah. um, but not at what they were doing right like I think it was very pointed that they weren't like making fun of D and D. They were like going mm -hmm. on this adventure. But either way, I was trying to decide if it was like <laughs> more or less confusing than the Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> adventure. And I feel like it was like equally like as confusing. Okay. The first time you watch the movie, you're like, there's a lot of places, there's a lot of people, a lot of bad guys. Like Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's fun. We'll, we'll get into it in a minute, but there's a lot that they pull from the game. So if you mm -hmm. play the game, a lot of it you're going to catch up on pretty quick. Like they even 
even like the places look like they're described in the books and look like they were in the cartoon versions. And so if you followed it for a long time or if you play regularly, you probably were like, oh my gosh, like way excited about it. So I could see kind of how that would be confusing. Um, but it is like Guardians of the Galaxy because it's high fantasy. So yeah. you're getting like a lot of those same elements. And like I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. So it should be no surprise that I also enjoyed this. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> this movie was two hours and 14 minutes long. Pretty mm-hmm. long, actually. Pretty long. Yeah, pretty yeah. long. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of adventure. And it came out May of last year. We already mentioned it was um, bookended by John Wick 4 and mm-hmm. the Super Mario Brothers movie. So it had a budget of $150 million. Which, which is pretty big. That's a pretty big budget. I mean, that's like a big Harry Potter movie. Like, that's yeah. huge. <laughs> I, I guess maybe like, I mean, we've talked about this, but like Marvel movies today have like astronomical budgets. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's just because of like they get top build actors and like the CGI that they use. But yeah. um, as mentioned, it flopped a little bit in the box office, still profitable. It made $208 million worldwide mm-hmm. and was directed by Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly. And yeah. they they wrote it too, right? Yeah. They're like a writing duo. They've written a couple things. They did Spider-Man Homecoming, Horrible uh, Bosses, and Cloudy uh, with a Chance of Meatballs too. So they're like, this is like kind of their genre. Like okay. they they do this very well. <laughs> but not Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 1. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> These I, are the popular ones. Okay. I love Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. <laughs> that movie I haven't watched in probably like 15 years. And I remember the Has first it been time out I watched- that long? I mean, I was- Oh my God. I can remember I like so where old. I watched it and my family sold that house at least like eight years ago. And I think oh it was God. like well before I went to college when I watched that movie for the first time. That makes me feel incredibly old. Because I do remember, too, when that came out and being like, that's stupid. But it was a really good movie. <laughs> stupid? <laughs> it's a it's a children's book. Okay. That like movie Chicken was Little. Fabulous. Chicken Little came into a movie. Fabulous. Like, yeah. Okay. It was a good movie. Whatever. <laughs> We're talking about Dungeons and Dragons. So we've got this score yeah. by Lauren Balf is his name, I believe. I don't and know who that is. <laughs> I don't know. But he was like was really good. excited. <laughs> yeah, he was excited about it because he played Dungeons and Dragons, I guess. Yeah, and- a lot. Okay, so a lot of the cast and crew are Dungeons and Dragons people, which makes sense, right? Because yes. if you're trying to like grab that like mentality and that feel, like you want people that have done this before. Yeah. So a lot of them have the directors too. Both of them are D&D guys. And um, John Daly actually has been playing a D&D campaign for over 20 years. Okay, we'll get into that when we get to like, <laughs> how do you play D&D? But that yeah. is nuts. It is nuts. But that's nuts. So this score, um, I guess the man Lauren Balfe is like Scottish maybe or – That makes sense. Had- yeah, so he, he like brought it. in the like folky Scottish yeah. roots. Also very Lord of the Rings-esque. <laughs> yes, yes. And and perfect for like the times, right? Mm-hmm. And then um, the film also features an original song called Wings of Time that Ooh. was like <laughs> fronted by Tame Impala. Who, what? Yes. And I was just sitting there <laughs> thinking like when I read that, I was like, 2023 was a good year for Tame Impala because he had this <laughs> and they were in this Barbie song and in Barbie. And yes, this song is just like a credit. It's a credit song. Yeah. But the Barbie song was like when they were like going through like, yeah, you know, it's to the Barbie big one. Land. Yeah. So good, good year for that man right there. <laughs> or a group. I think Tame Impala is a group. I don't know. Maybe. I've seen them live and I still don't know. So, <laughs> look, we're gonna sit here and like talk really extensively about D and D. We're not gonna pretend like we understand like all the pop culture music no. artists that are out. No. There. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so production was Allspark and Hasbro, mm-hmm. and distributed by Paramount. Yeah, so you can stream it on Paramount Plus. Oh, it was, it has it, this one like past hands by Multiple the production times. distribution companies? Yeah. Multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. The like um, rights to make a D&D movie. Okay, makes sense. Mm-hmm. And and there's been D&D shows before, right? Yeah, there's been a uh, TV like cartoon TV series. There's been other D&D movies. This one is actually like 
uh like remake it's not a remake per se but Mm -hmm. the same like campaign like a reboot of yeah reboot yeah yeah exactly okay and then as mentioned we have a very notable cast and Mm -hmm. i had no idea what i was getting into as i was watching this so every time one of these people like minus michelle rodriguez who Mm -hmm. played holga because i had never known of her before but Mm -hmm. i guess she's in like some of the fast and furious movies so if you like those and you like her in that you might like this but it made sense her being in this made sense for like the audience yeah and i also read that she like gained a bunch of muscle Muscle. mass for this movie too (laughs) all of her body hair (laughs) yeah she like grew armpit hair that's insane I mean, I would do that for a movie probably too, but I would do. But some have you ever? Okay, so I played this game very recently. That's like at a at a brewery, Mm -hmm. and it was like the premise is basically like these cards, and they're like things on it, and people have to guess how much money it would take you to do the thing. So one of the things was how much money would it take you to like not shave for a year, or like not yeah, and like that includes Mm. like. Like Everything. based on the what we were playing, it included like eyebrow, like plucking and stuff. Oh no! And I was like, literally, <laughs> so much money. It's not even funny. <laughs> but if we were doing it for like a month, it wouldn't be that much because I would just do that anyways. Like I don't, I don't maintain. Oh my body no, no, girl, well, that's but... insane. I shave my legs every shower. I haven't shaved actually in two days because I wore tights the other day, and I was like, that's fine. And I like feel disgusting. My um, my body hair is all like very blonde. Like, you can't really see it. Oh, lucky. So I, I get away with a lot. I'm very pale and have very dark <laughs> hair. So you can basically see it before it grows out of my body, but it's okay. So it's fine. <laughs> Chris Pine is our leading man who plays Edgen. An interesting name. And it's then fabulous. we get Rege Jean Page. Right. Who just appears right? as Zank. And <laughs> I just remembered, like, when he left Bridgerton and he was like, I'm on to bigger and better things. And it's just like hilarious that this is <laughs> this the next is thing that I yeah. see him in. And the <laughs> character that he's playing is this like stoic man. I'm like, mm-hmm. is this really like showing your range of acting, <laughs> sir? <laughs> he did a good job though. Yeah, he was fabulous. He did really good. And a lot of what he does is improvised. I so know. Like, I read that the yeah. walk, when he like walks away walks real straight, was completely <laughs> improvised. <laughs> And then we've got Hugh Grant, who plays Forge. Like random. Dude. Random addition. Very <laughs> random. But when I saw him, I was like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Hugh Grant's in this movie. Yeah. And then he made that like line about like being naughty or something. And I was like, what are we watching? <laughs> Is this Bridget Jones' diary? Maybe. And <laughs> then we also got a little quick cameo of Bradley Cooper as yeah. like a little man. He's called a halfling. That's like a, a real breed that you can be in the game. But what's really funny about that is they didn't advertise or mention that he was going to be in it at all. Good. And so when people watched this movie for the first time, like in theaters before really anything came out, it was a shock. But and it's also like supposed to be a joke, right? It's a quip. Yeah, of course. So it's hilarious. Like, we have to have somebody who's like extremely like recognizable like in order for it to be funny for it to land it can't just be like a random little person it has to be bradley cooper yeah it was perfect that was a perfect pick because he's so (laughs) like he played the character of like being the like really nice husband who like (laughs) genuinely wished well for holga like so well and he like seems so nice and i was like oh my gosh and his new wife was like i've heard all about you (laughs) oh no enjoy your life Oh, how sad. Um, my favorite character was played by Sophia Lillis, and that was Doric, oh, the yeah. tiefling girl. And I actually have her Funko Pop. Cute. I know. I take oh them gosh. out of the packaging. Don't come at me for that. Oh, but. now I get who that <laughs> is, though, because I've seen that on your shelf yeah, for like yeah. months. She's a little. Yeah. Yeah. She's very cute. I loved her. I thought her druid. character was so. Um, so entertaining. cute. Yeah, so adorable. Cute. And I'm what's really funny. So, yeah, she's been in other things. So she was in Asteroid City. Oh. And she was also in the, the new It movie. So oh. if you like her, because I really liked her, like the actress. And I'm like, I want to go watch more things with her in it. You can go see those. Um, but there's also a young adult novel written around Doric. 
and her character. So if you really like Doric, you can go read. It's called The Druid's Call by E.K. Johnston. And it's all about her and her backstory and her life, which I think is really That's cool. so neat. Mm-hmm. She, the actress, Sophia Lillis, has like mm-hmm. beautiful eyes. She's and like gorgeous. a really fabulous bone structure. Yeah. And yeah, she just looks so like interesting. <laughs> I think she's so cool. She is like my hands on my favorite. But also, I have played a tiefling druid before. And so it was just like mm. cool because I, I was like, as she was now. like doing things, I was like, oh, she's like this. Like you can tell which level she is because of the different like spells and characters she's able to turn into and stuff. Which is Oh, cool. that's so fun. I love yeah. that they like <laughs> seem – I mean, you are the only like true D and D person I know who's watched this movie and I talked to you about it. So I need like a little bit of more data on this. But yeah. I feel like probably the biggest undertaking with this movie would be like, hey, like, well, I also read something that Hugh Grant said that was like he was worried about the D and D fans because mm-hmm. they take it so seriously. Like, it's kind of something that you can't screw up. You have to be because- really careful too because the D and D community gets a lot of shit from people. Yeah, for being, like weird and having this weird game that they play when it's a completely normal game, okay. But like, there's a lot of stuff out there that makes fun of D and D, and so I think you have to be really careful when you're making a movie centered around it or a show that has D and D in it, not to offend this entire community of people that play this game. Yeah, I agree. Sounds tough. I think they did a good job. It was cute. They did. They did. Okay, so before we move on and do like all the things talking about D&D in the movie. We just want to say thank you for everyone tuning into this episode and all of our episodes. We absolutely love having you here and we're so excited to start talking about Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Yeah, thank you guys so, so much. Liz and I are so appreciative that you're here listening. So if you're loving what you're listening to, please, please, please share the pod with a friend. Subscribe and follow the pod on whatever platform that you listen to us on. And then definitely leave ratings or reviews and interact with us on socials. Liz runs our Instagram and is like very interactive. So I can almost guarantee if you like interact with our Instagram, you're going to get some interaction back and we love it. Yeah. So you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Be Critics Podcast. And like Courtney said, we've got all kinds of fun stuff that we post on there. And then also you can just see what we're up to. Courtney posts her workout playlists and all the movies that we watch that we don't make episodes on. We post our ratings and stuff. So yeah, we love it. Every now and then you'll get like legit content that comes straight from me. And it's like a gem. <laughs> Or like a weird (laughs) horror film list. (laughs) Yeah. If you ever see something that seems a little out of character, that's why. (laughs) So also check out our new partner, Reload. Reload has this really cool app. They house movie reviews. They generate personalized movie recommendations. And Reload is just a place where you can like build a community around movies and you can connect with your friends that also love movies. Um, And you can connect with your favorite creators who love movies. So definitely check it out because we are on there and you can um, find our content and uh, what we recommend that you watch. So we will put a link in the episode description to go and download the app. And when you do sign up, use our code. Our code is BCRIT. That's B-C-R-I-T. And I'm going to spell it out for you. So it's B as in boy who lived, C as in Courtney. R as in roll the dice, I as in imperious curse, and T as in Taylor Swift. T Swift, B crit, don't forget be crit. it. Okay, <laughs> I think it's time to get back into the episode. All right, so before we before we do that, I, like I said, we're going to talk a little bit about what Dungeons and Dragons is. And Courtney, okay. I know you probably have a lot of questions because you've never played. I have played a few campaigns. Um, I'm in no way an expert, but I do know a little bit. So I'm very intrigued. I <laughs> so I have all, I have a lot of friends here who like yeah. really are into D and D, and I've been mm-hmm. considering hopping in on one of their campaigns. And I you just should. like I'm nervous because <laughs> I know it's a big time commitment, and I know you kind of yeah. have to like really get into it. And I feel like it's something I would enjoy. Um, mm-hmm. And I've played it. I've played like miscellaneous games before, but I know that's not really how you enjoy it. Like I feel like you have to be in a campaign to enjoy mm-hmm. it. Yeah, you've got to be in the party. 
So first of all, a common misconception is that D&D is a LARPing game, which LARPing is live action role play, meaning you are jumping around, hitting swords, dressing up, moving around in real life. That is okay. not what D&D is. I kind of forgot that people think that because yeah. I think I've I've had enough friends at this point that like actually play D&D to mm-hmm. know that that's not the case, but yeah. I do believe there was a time when I also thought that. Yeah. So that's not what it is. That's more like renaissance. Like, I don't even know. Just like LARPing. But But there's nothing wrong with that either. Renaissance fairs are fun. LARPing can be (laughs) cool. But that is not what D&D is. Um, D&D is a tabletop role-playing game. So an RPG, which is what a lot of people refer to it as. And that's pretty much like you're seated. You will get into character. You might use an accent. You know, you're going to be interacting with each other. But you don't really – like maybe you might have – Depending on your DM, you might have uh, props, but probably not. And you're just kind of like dungeon master. Yeah, dungeon master. Yeah. Yeah. So Dungeons and Dragons is also called D and D, and it's also called D and D, like just depending on who you're talking to. So D and D and D and D are the same thing. It's all Dungeons and Dragons. Okay. Um, The game came out in 1974. So the first wow. ever like published D&D game was in 1974. So it's been around for a long time. Our parents grew up with it. And I actually, um, I think I was probably like 12 or 13. My dad gave me like his copy of D&D. What? And so I had like the original game. I have no idea where it is right now, but I used to have it. <laughs> so okay. I did at one point have it. <laughs> this makes so much sense, like why you like <laughs> this game. Because like I understand that me and you are both big gamer people in general, mm-hmm. like strategic board games and like the occasional like PlayStation game as well. But this one just like never fit for me with you. And I just never <laughs> understood it. But now I do. I get it. It makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, and D&D is also, and this came from an article, but it is considered the game that jumpstarted modern role-playing games. And it's also influenced mm. most of the video games that we play today. So well, yeah, it's kind, to- it kind of revolutionized everything. I was going to say, when you said it's an RPG, like uh, how many games that you play like, on your Xbox or your Harry PlayStation yeah. are RPG games? Mm-hmm. And you don't even realize that like, this maybe kickstarted a lot of that. Yeah. It's and it's really the same. It's very, very similar, except instead of you like playing online with a controller, you're acting it out a little bit. Except you're not running around. You're just like sitting at the table and acting it out. Okay. So we've taught we've thrown out a few um things that have to do with like how you actually play the game. So I'm just gonna like really quickly tell you how the game is played. Okay. So you have a dungeon master, which we said it's referred to as the DM. It's the game's narrator, and it's referred to as the referee. They're the ones that create the scenario, the setting, and the storyline, which is referred to as a campaign. So if you're on a campaign, you're on a storyline that your DM has either created for you or that they've used like an online version and then like worked the characters in some way. It's very okay. creative, like. They've got to be quick on their feet. They come up with like all the obstacles, whether or not you can and can't do things. That that's that's what the DM does. Everybody has the friend that they know would enjoy <laughs> yes. being the DM. Like yes. the friend who, when you're trying to corral a group of people, you're like, okay, Bob, like, can you please make this <laughs> yeah. happen? And yeah. they make it happen and you know that everything will be all right. Like mm-hmm. they're the friend that you're like, okay, we'll do as you say in this mm-hmm. game here. Yeah. So we have a friend, his name is Preston, who plays a lot of D&D and has like for a long time. And I've been trying to convince him to start his own campaign and mm-hmm. include us in it. So we'll fun. see. We'll see. I talked to him last this weekend about years. it. So. <laughs> oh, 20 years. Oh, that would be a long time. <laughs> let's, let's not. I wish that. Okay. The players create their characters. So D&D has a rule book and there's different races and different like backgrounds that you can choose from. I'm not going to go into them. You can go look them up yourself. But the cre- the players create their own characters. And then the dungeon master will fit the characters into their campaign. Do you pick like your social hierarchy, like where you stand in the world? Sometimes, yeah. Like yeah. in one campaign, I was a princess. Cool. So, yeah. so the highest – Social hierarchy you could be. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 
then you have your group, which is referred to as the party. So the party is going on a campaign. That's how you kind of talk about it. Um, the Got campaign it. begins. Players meet each other. They verbally role play as their respective characters to achieve a common goal, complete a quest, gather treasure, whatever it may be. So that's like how the game goes. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I can see like the party bit like exactly how they portrayed that in this movie because they mm -hmm. like formed a group and then they went on this campaign to like mm -hmm. defeat the bad guy basically. They had all these like mm -hmm. side quests along the way. Yeah. Little things yeah. that pop up. You're like, oh my God, what is this? Like, of course. Um, something interesting that I came across and I'm sure you did as well is that the cast and crew actually played a D and D campaign to help get everyone into their characters' mindsets. So they oh, no. they got That's everybody perfect. together and they played a campaign, and then they started filming. Yeah, so I'm like glad that they did something like that because I think that helped like somebody like you who really loves D and D to like pick up on the little things that they would do. Yeah. So in this movie, there's. It's high fantasy, so a lot of it is, like, imaginative. Um, but it was really important for the directors and the production group to bring as much practical effects into it as possible. Because we've talked about this before. The more practicality there is, the more realistic it is. It's just mm – -hmm. it just is. And so everywhere they could, they used practical effects. They used, obviously, a mix of computer-generated and practical um, but one that stands out to me, I listened to an entire two and a half hour long podcast about like how this movie was made. Oh, wow. And one of the more interesting ones that's actually practical is when they are in – they're with they're with Forge and they're in his study and Sophina is there mm -hmm. and they like go to run at him and the floor turns into quicksand. Oh, yeah. And that was practical. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So yeah. I liked that a little bit because it happened so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. And then the whole group of people that is judging them when they're in the jail and they're like up for getting out or what the pardoning or whatever, those mm -hmm. are all animatronic. So there's people, it's people with like animatronic heads. Yeah. You can kind of tell. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. I <laughs> like really the cool. Birdman one. He was cool. <laughs> one that I thought Jonathan. was good. <laughs> Jonathan, what a name. <laughs> One that I thought was good was uh, the Bradley Cooper part because yeah. they – you could tell it was practical because they would mm -hmm. show the characters separately yeah. and then like they use kind of like what they did with Hagrid in Harry Potter mm -hmm. where they just used like a really big chair for Bradley Cooper to make it look like yeah. he was small. Well, so – the prop department made two of everything, one that was mm -hmm. smaller and one that was bigger. So that way when you like saw Bradley Cooper standing next to the staff, it looked like it was like almost his size. But then when Holga was holding it, it was like small. I don't know. It was, yeah. I thought that was cool. I that think that's smart. one of the like oldest ones in the book, you know, like how to make <laughs> people look different sizes. Well, you have to make the props different sizes. Yeah, exactly. So the movie was – some of it was shot on location um, and they used a location that you probably recognized. Well, so they used the Onwick Castle, which is in the Harry Potter series. Yeah. Yeah. I read that because I recognized it. And he said that like a lot of the hallway shots are like from Harry, the Harry, the same set that Harry Potter was done on. Yeah. Which yeah. is really cool. I yeah. Really cool. Super cool. <laughs> and then a lot of the outdoor scenes are shot on the Causeway Coast in North Ireland. So there's okay. a lot of shot on location. The parts that are not shot on location, you can tell they're not shot on location. Like the maze that was com completely computer generated. That maze was giving me such Hunger Games vibes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And Harry Potter because of the maze, but very Hunger Games. Yeah. So – in the maze – well, okay, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. So there's a bunch of homages to the game. We've already alluded to that. And they actually did bring on a, like, expert, like a DD and d expert to make sure that they were staying true to the game, like, cool. as much as they could. So every spell, all of the different races and different, like, personality types that you see, those are all game references. Um this takes place in the Forgotten Realms, which is an original campaign setting for D&D. &D. 
So Neverwinter, Revel's End, and the Underdark are all part of the Forgotten Realms. A lot of the monsters, if not all of the monsters, I didn't recognize any that weren't part of the game, but they're all D&D monsters. So the Gelatinous Cube that they come encounter with, there's rust monsters randomly throughout, and then the big fat chubby dragon is um, Thembershod. I like that the gelatinous so. cube is a monster. That's so It's like funny. one of the OG monsters too. Yeah. Like one of the very original monsters. It was one of the scariest ones in that movie because I was just thinking there, like if I got in that cube, like how the heck would I get out? I don't know. You can't. You're no. stuck You're unless somebody pulls you out. There um, were a couple moments in this movie where I was like, oh, that's like very surprisingly graphic. Like at the <laughs> end when all the like guys up in that room – where Sophina was, like mm-hmm. when they all started like vomiting out their mouth, yeah. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> that just happened. Okay, goodbye, <laughs> sis. You're dead. <laughs> yep. Bye. Yeah. yeah. And like some of the monsters and stuff, I was like, oh, that was very violent. Or like, oh, that was like a very legitimate fight scene. Okay. Mm-hmm. Hello. <laughs> okay. And so we talked about this like a little bit at the very beginning of the episode, but they did a really good job making sure that they understood their audience in this movie and that they used as much as they could from the game to make it exciting for people who liked the game. But they didn't they didn't go too far with it. Um, but the creator of D&D or one of the co-creators, Ed Greenwood, who he's not credited in the movie at all, but he said he loved the movie and he was happy to see his creation faithfully adapted for the big screen. So that's like yeah. an A plus win. When yeah, you that's get the huge. creator excited about it. Yeah, one thing that I saw too is that they tried to bring in like a lot of comedy. Mm-hmm. And I think I kind of alluded to this before, but they didn't want to go like w- so, so far with it that they felt like they were like making fun of D&D. So like, mm-hmm. I, I personally think they did a really good job of like being comedic without – like I was never like laughing at the game. I felt like I was like laughing with the characters the whole time, which I think was like, like a, a hit. Like that was a good thing. Yeah. They did a good job, too, of, like, as someone who plays, that's, like, how you imagine the game. So, like, how you would imagine you're interacting with people and how the world around you would look. Like, we talked about already, but Regé Jean Page, when he goes and just, like, walks over the rock, like, that would be something that a character would do and just be, like, I'm going to roll to rock straight over, walk straight over the rock. And, like, <laughs> he got a perfect 20. Like, here we go. He's walking over the rock, you know? Like, that's just, like, how it yes. would go. And it's funny. It's funny stuff because that's what people do in the game. So, it worked Aww. out really well. That's cute that it hit that way too. Mm-hmm. And the D&D community has been very like supportive of this movie, obviously very excited about it. And the owners of D&D, the game, it's called Wizards of the Coast. They actually made stat blocks for each of the main characters in the movie. So you can go and play them if you'd like to in a campaign, which is fun. That is so cool. I read that. And I didn't understand what that meant. So <laughs> thank you for explaining that that means that I can now be that person in a campaign. Yep. Yep. Cool. You can. <laughs> yeah. oh, I liked Simon. I would be him. Simon's the a cutie. Spellcast. He's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the movie opens and Edwin and Holga are in prison in this like frozen tundra and they're up for pardoning. They kind of like throw the pardoning out the window. They're like, scratch that. We're we're not worried about being pardoned and we're just going to escape and get out of there. Yeah. And so that's like how the movie opens. What were your first impressions of Holga and Edgen? Okay, well, you did skip over while they were in the cell. There was like the whole bit about the potatoes, okay? <laughs> and he was like, Edgen was like, you don't want to mess with Holga because she's eating her potatoes. And this is like her favorite time of the day. <laughs> and I was like, this is hilarious. Like this is like – how we're opening up this movie, like this is going to be comedic. And that was when I had my first like, oh my God, I'm watching Guardians of the Galaxy. So like (laughs) immediately I got the vibe. You know what I mean? It's like they did a good job with them and their interactions. Mm -hmm. And I think catching that, like that was the way you're supposed to feel about them is like they're like a duo Mm -hmm. who's like been in it for a long time already. They had really good chemistry from the get-go. Like you could tell immediately. Yes. Um, and then we do get a little bit of Egan's backstory, which is another like play at the game because throughout your campaign, you'll get little bits of everyone's backstory ha- as it mm-hmm. pertains to what's going on. 
and how everyone's interacting together. I did like that because I remember thinking like while he was going through the story, which I'm glad that they broke it up some throughout. Mm -hmm. Like they kept like pulling it back to reality, which I kind of feel like that was like kind of similar to how it would actually go if you were playing, right? Like somebody would say something funny and you'd be like, wait, but where's Jonathan? Trying to tell my backstory. Like, let me be. And like, I just felt like that was very, it felt like the game. Like it felt Mm -hmm. like, somebody's reading and you're sitting there and you're like trying to pay really good attention but it's also kind of funny because you're like what the fuck man like why are you doing the, all this stuff in your backstory yeah um, so then they kidnap one of these like chancellors i guess and use him because he's a flying animal type race and jump out of the window that's in the pardoning room. <laughs> they really and didn't have to do game. at all. No, they were being pardoned. Like they were being pardoned. But anyway, they had already come up with the idea. So they were going through with it, right? Mm-hmm. And so they they jump out. They kidnap him out the window. He gets injured. It's like this whole thing. Um, but then they start walking and they walk and walk until they find where they're going. And then they decide to go to a pub to figure out what to do next. And they see a familiar face on a piece of parchment and then they set off to Neverwinter to reunite with Kyra. Cute. Yeah. I, and that whole section gave me like Renaissance vibes, like big Renaissance fair vibes. Yes. Yeah. Music and, I, and everything. And a little bit of like Game of Thrones vibes for mm-hmm. sure. Like being in the pub and like I did like all the music and I liked I liked all the backstory with Kira and – I don't know. I just – I thought it was goofy too that they <laughs> like got pardoned and then escaped and then later after that, they saw them like in the paper and they had yeah. like run away and I was like, y'all run are away. idiots. Like you you had this in the bag <laughs> and then went away with it. Yep. Um, so then they – you know, they get to Neverwinter and they discover that Forge is actually the Lord of Neverwinter. And they find out that he has betrayed them because he hasn't been giving Kyra the full story or telling her lies altogether and pretty much turning her against them. Then they are sentenced to beheading (laughs) and somehow get out of that very like by the hair of their chins. Okay. And then they're like, we got to get this party together. I'm going to start with this sorcerer that's like slightly incompetent. And that's kind of where it goes. All of those bits with Forge are like Hugh Grant at his finest in this movie, let (laughs) me tell you. I thought that was all hilarious. And I think think all of that was very well acted and it was funny and it like made me feel – like you kind of saw the struggle that Edgin was going to go through the whole movie that was like, okay, like Mm -hmm. is he going after riches or like stealing stuff? And it's also like the classic like – it's very similar to Guardians of the Galaxy actually because it's like like a thief, right? Like he likes to like do heists and you're like, Mm -hmm. okay, he's kind of bad but like I kind of like him, right? Like he's he's who I'm voting for or rooting Mm -hmm. for during this movie. So – yeah, that's and it's too like one of the groups that you can be in in D and D. So, like, Holga is a barbarian, mm-hmm. and Egan's a bard. So the bards are like musically entertaining kind of thing, mm. which is why he sings throughout. But Randomly they, keep, breaks into they song. keep to their characters. So Holga's this this barbarian, and she's this like big woman, and she's great at fighting. She understands all the tools and. She's a warrior, and then you've got this little bard who's like, I can sing you a little tune, maybe. But like, yeah, I don't know. It, it works I loved, really well. I love the bit when you mentioned like she's about to get beheaded, <laughs> and she like grabs the stone and like puts it behind her head to like mm-hmm. break free, and then yeah. she's like out there like fighting like every guard <laughs> in this alleyway, she's and Chris like- Pine's like over there in the corner just like <laughs> trying to saw off his like <laughs> rope binding that's binding his wrist, and I'm like, uh-huh. dude. <laughs> You're like setting a precedent. I see how this is going to go. I mean, I think he was supposed to be like purposefully going slow. Yes, like not trying to be involved at all. But there's probably like that player too in the game, Brady and D, who's just like, I'm just going to go over here and total my thumbs and watch (laughs) y'all. Like, just keep going in this campaign. No one's going to notice me. Well, the bards don't really have like this is this is getting into the game, but the bards don't really have like 
a ton of strength and a ton of skill when it comes to fighting. So if they went to like roll to use that skill, they might do something bad. So a lot of times mm. they'll just like sit on the outskirts and like do something else. Like, I don't know. I'm going to grab some berries because maybe I'll be hungry after this. Like, I don't know. But That's like people in Catan who only buy development cards. And you're like, <laughs> what you doing over there? You're supposed to be building houses <laughs> and cities and you're just buying dev cards. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. But – so in that scene, we also get like our first choreographed fight scene, which is pretty cool. Oh, it's great. It was amazing. Yeah. I was honestly really well. like shocked at how good the fighting looked in this movie. I expected it to be kind of silly and it wasn't at all. Yeah, it was really, really good. Mm-hmm. They, did, they did a great job with the choreography and like they did a really good job going between like the things that were going on. So you'd see Holga, like you said, and she's like over here being this like badass female fighter and then you've got like chris pine in the corner like (laughs) and it's just like and then it would like go back and she's like doing something else cool it just worked it just worked um but then we get simon so then they they go and they find simon and i like that scene he's a sorcerer and he's put on a magic show but not really and he's not very good at magic he does some kind of shitty magic um, and then gets caught stealing from all of his patrons, which is kind of telling. Yes. But I also – I like I like how that scene went where he kept like changing the gravity and I kept going back and <laughs> forth. Yeah, yeah, it was cute. And I also liked – I think it gave a very good introduction between him and Chris Pine that like El- Edgen didn't care – how good or bad he was as a sorcerer. He was just like, mm-hmm. oh, same old, trying to steal <laughs> yeah. from his people. Like, I'm behind him. This is and my he guy. just like got there and then like helped him escape. And mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Was, like, this is honestly like the perfect thing that could have happened because now, like, I have incentive to swoop in and be like, join my, join my uh, party over here. Mm-hmm. So that's the first time we really see like spells. Like, you, you see the witch do spells. Um, but you don't really know what's going on when she's doing them. So it's the first time we see someone who's like really, really using spells at a lower level. And a lot of the spells that Simon does, he uses sign language as his hmm. choreography. So That's a lot cool. of what you see is he's like signing like what would be happening, um, which so I don't cool. know sign language. So I I didn't really catch on to that but if you did that would be a really cool thing like a really cool way to like bridge the connection there wasn't there a time when you were trying to learn asl i know the alphabet and i can like say hello and ask if someone needs help that's like all i can do i can spell things out that's not super helpful more than me i'm pretty (laughs) sure i'm not gonna do it i feel like i'm gonna offend somebody so i'm just gonna just gonna my keep my hands in my lap my sorority in college one of our um like philanthropy causes was the starkey hearing foundation and so we learned the we learned like basic sign language when i was in my sorority so that's good to know it's It's great it's a great skill so then we get an introduction to the Emerald Enclave and Doric, who we've talked a little bit about, um, but Doric is a tiefling druid. So a tiefling is half like, half human and then half like demon. And so that's why she was kind of like shunned a little bit and her parents gave her up is because the tieflings, people like don't know what to do with them don't know if they're bad or good um, and they get like a bad rap. So that's kind of like how her character is introduced. Uh, And then that makes sense. Yeah. The druids are kind of like masters of the elements. So they can like use the elements. They're in tune with nature, which is why she can change into different animals. Um, But that's kind of what's going on with Doric. And yeah, that makes so much sense. I didn't really understand like her backstory of like why mm-hmm. her family abandoned her or mm-hmm. like why they she kind of skipped with... over it a little bit. Yeah. I mean, I understood yeah. that like she thought that the land she was at was very important because the people there basically took her in. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So we got like that bit of it. But yes, no, they did not do a full backstory like they did with Edgen. Mm-hmm. I think they would have lost people if they went through all of it. <laughs> yeah, it would have been a little bit too much lore. Um, the people who already understand it, like get it, and the people who don't got enough of it that it was fine. Yeah. Um, but while we're getting all of that information, we're also seeing that Sophina has something going on. And she's not exactly who she says she is. And there's this vault in the castle with all these riches and something's going on with everything. Like something's not right. And we get a little bit of backstory where we find out that she's actually a red wizard, which is a bad guy. So she made me think of a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. So in Game of Thrones, like the red woman who Mm -hmm. comes up in like season – yeah. She honestly is in like the first season, but she's like throughout. Yeah. But she – it reminds me a lot of her. But then she also – okay. So you know how her like makeup was like – her eyelids were super crazy dark that her eyes mm-hmm. looked like sunken in? Yeah. Like she made me think of um, Raven from Teen Titans. Did you ever watch <laughs> I that? can see that. Yes. Yeah. Like with her like hooded yeah. cloak thing. Her makeup was very strategic because, again, that's like a character arc character type that you can play. Mm -hmm. And they had to be really careful with how they portrayed her because she is in hiding. Um, Mm. But she's also a wizard. And a lot of the like high wizards will devote like their entire lives to it. That's why she has all these tattoos of the runes and things like that is because like that that is her identity and her personality and she's in hiding of that's what she is which she she still is that but she's like the bad version of that. I like that scene where she like takes her hood off and Hugh Grant walks in and is like, "Oh, you took your hood off. You should uh <laughs> maybe put not that back that. on." <laughs> but, but I'm not one to tell you what to do, so uh do whatever you want. <laughs> Or like when he's got the hot coffee and he's like, it's a little bit hot. And she like turns her finger and he's like, I didn't realize you're going to put your finger in it. it. Um, I'm going to put that for later. (laughs) (laughs) He had some really good comedic line delivery. Yeah. If you enjoyed him in this movie, you need to go see Wonka because. Is he in Wonka? Yes. Oh, I didn't realize that. That's cool. He's Oompa Loompa. Oh. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) <laughs> forgot about that. I did know that. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's going to be like a Bradley Cooper situation. Oh, it's so good. Okay. Um So anyway, we get Doric, the Doric chase scene. So Doric turns herself into a fly and she, you know, goes in and is trying to figure out what's going on, and then we get the chase scene where she's turning into all these different animals because she's number one she's scared but then secondly she's trying to figure out like how am I going to get away from these people Mm -hmm. and it was a great scene I thought so too and they went this podcast that I listened to was they were talking about how when they filmed it they tried to do long shots and so a lot of it is just like one take where they're like going through this city and Mm. like putting her in it right um but i i thought that was really cool i love that scene i think it's super fun i thought it was very entertaining mm -hmm. like i i found my eyes that kind of glued to the scene during it like watching it all happen Mm -hmm. yep and then we get some magic relics and magic things that are happening like the tablet of reawakening the arcane seal of morning kynan and then the helmet of disjunction is the next one and we didn't really say this but they've got to break into this vault right they want all the stuff mm-hmm. in the vault they're like we're not only are we going to expose forge for what he is we're going to steal everything we're going to take it all we're going to get out of town but Doric finds out that the vault is sealed by this arcane seal that they need this helmet of disjunction to open. What a silly name, helmet of disjunction. <laughs> yes. Um, so they set out 
to find this helmet of disjunction because Holga just so happens to know that the last fight her people were in, they had this helmet. And so they're going to go and see if they can find this helmet amongst the dead of that fight. I loved that whole (laughs) bit. It was hilarious. Like them going to where the battlegrounds were and like Mm -hmm. digging up the people and asking them questions. And the whole bit where Chris Pine like accidentally asked him like questions over and over (laughs) and over again. (laughs) And then every single time he said something like it was a question, he's like, why'd you say okay at the end of that? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Absolutely hilarious. Um, But before they get there, they just so happen to pass by Marleman's house. Holga's Mm. love interest, Marleman, who is the halfling Bradley Cooper. And you get that whole interaction, which is just adorable and hilarious. And at the end of that, you get Egan's first song. So he's a bard. And if you know the lore, bards can persuade people with their songs. So he plays a song that's going to make Holga happy and feel better. So that's that's kind of where that um, le- I like, leads off. <laughs> I like that they bled that into his personality a bit too. Like I I get now that you're telling me that that's like his thing as a mm-hmm. bard, but they almost made it because they kept asking like, what's your thing? Like, what are you good for in this group here, sir? Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, I make the plans. Like, that's what I do. <laughs> but really, like, what I took away from it when I was watching is that, like, mm-hmm. this man is kind of like the glue that keeps everyone together and, like, motivates everyone to keep going. Mm-hmm. So, like, he's, like, uh, keeping everybody, like, in good spirits and jovial. And that kind of says, like, oh, he's, like, literally, like, has powers with his, like, music that, like, makes that a thing. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. So through their interrogation of the dead, they find out that they need to go to this paladin named Zank, who a paladin's like a like a magical person kind of. Um, Okay. And when they get to him, who that's Raja Jean Page. We'll talk about him in a second. When get when they get to him, he says that he has hidden it in the underdark, which is kind of like the underworld i guess yeah um but yeah so we, like we get ray j jean page as zank yender i think it's yender and he's a paladin and they go and they retrieve the thing yeah all of that scene was cute i like the okay i have like a couple moments that i like so one was when he like spent forever explaining like how to get across this bridge mm-hmm. and like i was like this feels i don't know if this is accurate to D or not but it feels like you would have like the right dungeon master he'd be like we're doing this puzzle and like that's gonna be like mm-hmm. our quest today yeah and then like simon was like oh man we're not doing this puzzle we're gonna do an adventure and like <laughs> so what would have happened there is simon's character was probably a little mischievous and he's like i'm gonna roll to screw up the puzzle <laughs> the dm would be like i guess you can roll to screw up the puzzle and he probably rolled higher than whatever the dm said he had to roll and he's like all right you screw up the puzzle how are you gonna yep. get across now <laughs> good luck yeah. and then they just like happened to have the like walking stick that was actually like the, the hither thither staff. hither thither stuff yes <laughs> that yes see there's a lot of names but that was cute i really liked that and i liked how they were ingenious about how they used the portals so like that mm-hmm. scene was obviously the introductions they did like seemingly more basic stuff but then when they brought it back later in the movie it was actually like really useful and they got creative with it yeah so with like with that whole situation i just made a note of this movie like understanding its audience so so well like Mm -hmm. all the little nods to things and just keeping it realistic of how people would play the game really um yeah made it all work so well yeah um and then the but other then thing I like, oh, a dragon. <laughs> oh, a dragon. dragon. Yes, <laughs> yeah, the dragon thing was good. Very scary. <laughs> I liked the like sword in the head of the dragon. It felt very like Harry Potter sword in the top of the basilisk. There we go. Yeah, yeah. But he yeah. missed and didn't actually kill the dragon. <laughs> well, he like he did what he needed to do. He injured it for a second in that moment. He saved Chris Pine's life. He did. He saved all their lives. Mm-hmm. Definitely. 
So they defeat the dragon, obviously, and they emerge victorious from the Underdark with the Helmet of Disjunction. But then they were relying on Simon to attune with it. Mm. So that was a, a whole other thing. That was cute, though, that his thing was like he had to have – like he had to feel confident in himself to like mm-hmm. attune with the helmet. Yeah. So it, it gave him like a little character arc. Yeah. And I don't know if you picked up on this, but every time you put the helmet on, he would kind of like go to this other like plane. And it's called the ethereal plane, which is like a real location in D&D that you can like play around with, with magic and stuff. Um, but this is kind of like the first time it was ever really portrayed on a screen. And so they got mm. to like play around with it. I thought they did a really good job. It looked really cool. I liked the effect of the present like, time slowing dripping. down while he yeah. was there mm-hmm. because it I, I thought it looked cool and it felt yeah. cool and it kind of made it feel like uh like you felt the time pressure that he was in while he was in mm-hmm. that uh realm or whatever it's called yeah. um because he felt like he needed to like get back to the present time kind of yeah, he's like, I just want to tune with this damn thing. And then they showed it to you in real time, and he, like, puts it on and then, like, flies across the mm-hmm. – <laughs> Yeah. Chris Pine was like, well, in this time, you – it came off as soon as you put it on your head. And yeah. he's like, well, <laughs> time moves differently. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Simon is working with trying to attune with the helmet, and they're like, listen – we should just find a new way to get into this vault, right? Like, how are we going to do it? And like you said, they're geniuses. They decide they're going to use the portals with the Hither Thither staff. And they set out to make that happen. They were a cute little bunch going after <laughs> the Hither Thither, Hither Thither staff <laughs> and yeah. putting it in that, like, cart thing. Yes. Oh, my God. Genius. Yes. Like who comes Gen- up with Very this? genius. <laughs> I I like that it felt like in that moment, it felt like a heist movie because mm-hmm. they like had this plan and I almost felt like I could imagine the like music that went along with it as they were like, it's like, yeah, but like they also didn't care about the riches, which is the funny part about it. Yeah. But then they went through all that work, and then the mirror was just facing the floor. It just fell over. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, okay, plan C. Yeah. Which is and actually just, plan A. <laughs> immediately, like, just, like, what's the word I'm looking for? They just, like, immediately decide. They're like, all right, we're just going to do something different. And just like, yeah. bro, you like, you you could just keep going with this. Like, why are you yeah. – why are you moving on so quickly? Well, sometimes you just have to like weigh your options. Like going on with this would take way too long. Sounds very hard. We're just going to have to revert, go to something else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Doric's character never gave up. She's like, I will get in. I will make this work. <laughs> um, and the rest of them find themselves in a, a little bit of a pickle. They get into an epic battle throughout the castle, all split up in different locations. Um. But when it mattered most, Simon did a tune with the helmet. That was cool. And they got it. Was into a really cool vault. moment. Yeah, it was a really cool moment. And you're like, man, like Simon, good for you. Mm-hmm. Like, go. We're so happy for you. Um, but then they find out they're in different vaults. So there was a fake vault. And there was a real vault. And now they're captured and they're being sentenced to death. But the bard talks his way out of it. And says, but wait, why don't we just get sentenced to participate in your high games? So that's what happens. Yeah. And then it felt like the Hunger Games movie for like 10 minutes. (laughs) And I was like, whoa. (laughs) They go into the maze, which was very similar to the Goblet of Fire maze, if I do say so myself. And all these like weird things in it and puzzles and Weirdly more accurate to the Harry Potter book than the Goblet of Fire movie maze was to the Harry Potter book because it had actual like magical creatures in the maze mm-hmm. that you have to fight. Yeah, you had to overcome something. Mm-hmm. Um, the little like cats with the like Venus flytrap antenna, mm-hmm. that was like very scary and how it would like become two and Projected the one was a itself. foe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was yeah. tricky. That's a real monster. 
Um, one really cool callback for this one, which I am not this much of a D&D fan, so I didn't really pick up on this. But when I was talking to our friend Preston, he told me that the party you see in the safe cage in the middle that they've like made their way into the cage yeah. is the party from the original D&D cartoon from the 1980s. Oh, so I did you read knew, that they had a cameo would. in this movie, so that makes mm-hmm. so much sense. Yeah. And they were um, like, oh, wait, what? You're not going to come in this cage with us, people? Yeah. No? Goodbye? Whatever. <laughs> and they were like, um, if we keep, if we go in this cage, we're just going to stay in this cage and keep fighting and then we're all going to die. And they were like, yeah. <laughs> what do we do? And then Doric has the great idea to use the gelatinous cube that's going to be sucked smart. down into the floor. She's a very intelligent young one. Um, so they're able to escape. And they confront Forge at his getaway boat. They steal his boat and they ride off into the sunset. But wait, there's more. But not really. Yeah. No. <laughs> of course they don't, right? That'd be too um, easy, honestly. Yeah. So as they're riding off into the sunset, trying to figure out how they're going to spend all their riches, they look back and they see that Sophina is conjuring the beckoning death which we know what that is because Zank told us, right? Um, yes. And they're like, we got to turn the ship around to save the people of Neverwinter. Okay. I loved the part with the parachute and the riches coming out and then like mm-hmm. dr- like getting the people to come out of the arena. That was so like not what I was expecting to happen mm-hmm. at all that I was like yeah. oh wait this is so cute and that to me felt very d d esque right because yeah. you've got this like like so many other movies you just have this like culminating battle at the end right and like that was kind of what I was expecting in that moment and for that not to happen I was like oh wait this is so fun like they were creative about this mm-hmm. yeah they did a really good job with that and making them not just like run away and be like, I don't care. And mm-hmm. oh, like, well, of course they're not back. going to. Well, yeah, well, some people might not care. Um, yeah, I guess if you were playing this game, you could be like, yeah, let her take over. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be, a, we'll go with I our riches. <laughs> to leave with the riches. Um, <laughs> so then they get into a fight with the Red Witch Sophina which is another really epic battle. And the team takes some hits and one very important team member is in critical condition at the end. Okay, I liked before we get to Holga, I liked the battle, especially when it got to like the very, very end and it was Mm -hmm. like all of them fighting her. And it was so like quick and like it kind of like panned around. It was a very good, Mm well-shot moment. And... They let you in on the fact that they planned for her to use that time spell against them. Yeah. And they had the the little cuff that they gave to Kyra with her little like invisibility pendant. And she was so put tricky. it on her. I was tricked. I thought they were done for. I was like, how the heck are they going to get out of this? But I also was wondering, where the heck is Kyra? I haven't seen her in a minute. She's invisible. She could be anywhere. I Yeah. I was very confused about her. <laughs> yeah. That was fun. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, But then at the end, you do see that Holga has been stabbed by the Red Wizard Blade, which is incurable. And she dies, sadly. But the way that they brought her back was so cute because Mm -hmm. like Chris Pine – had that whole speech where he was like, your mom, I wanted to bring your mom back. Well, really wanted to bring my wife back, like kind of recognizing that like it wasn't for his daughter. It was for him. And then to have the little montage of Holga and Kyra and like how like she basically was her mom in like the true sense of it. Like not that her original mom didn't want to be there, but like Holga like ended up taking on that role and Mm -hmm. it was cute. I liked it. Yeah, it was good. And they brought her back with the Tablet of Reawakening, which is what they were going after the whole time. Mm -hmm. And it just worked so well. And I love when Holga wakes up and she's like, don't tell me you wasted it on me. (laughs) Yeah, it was funny. And they're like, it was well spent. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, 
but yeah so then we get the end of the movie everybody kind of lives happily ever after doric and simon decide they're going to go on another date zinc sets off to catch forge because his whole thing is that he has to do what's right um so he goes and gets forge nor lord never ember wakes up and sentences forge to prison oh yeah (laughs) that was funny (laughs) at the end and then forge tries to do the same thing that they did and use jonathan (laughs) to escape but they had closed up they had the yeah they had thought of that one at this point (laughs) yep very cute so yeah movie in a nutshell (laughs) yeah it was very funny and very cute and I like the story. And I like that they closed all the character arcs at the end also. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. I think it's time to rate it. Let's do it. Do I get to rate it first this yeah. time? Yes. Yeah. And as a reminder, we read on Letterbox Zero to five stars with half star increments. Mm-hmm. I think I am going to give this one. I'm rating it in real time, people. Um, Because I actually just watched this movie like literally right before we (laughs) recorded. And I think I'm going to give it a three and a half stars. That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Great rating. I I think it was a really cute movie and funny. And it was an adventure movie. But like I mentioned before, it was easy enough for me to follow. Like as easy as Guardians of the Galaxy is to follow as long Mm -hmm. as you're paying attention and I liked it a lot more than I thought I was going to because I'm glad <laughs> yeah I know ne- I've never really played D&D and I feel like the common misconception would be that this movie is going to be like too nerdy to understand or enjoy and that's definitely not mm-hmm. the case yeah. okay so my score <laughs> <laughs> I gave this four and a half out of five I'm oh, wow. very into this movie I've not watched it multiple times four and a half out of five not a five, though? Not a five. What would have made this a five for you? I think it needed to be a little bit longer. I felt like the end oh. got a little bit, like, rushed. Yeah. Okay. They okay. Could, they could have gone more into the lore. And, like, I understand why they didn't. But for me, for it to be a five for me, like, that's what it would have needed. Yeah. Still yeah, totally understand. Movie. Still loved it. <laughs> I feel like if I were to like play a whole D&D campaign and then like come back and rewatch this, I bet I would rate it higher. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, you probably would. Yeah. Um but yeah, great movie. I've literally been recommending it to everyone. Like people will ask me because Hayden tells everyone that I'm a movie critic, LOL. And so I get go to oh, his work events and they're like, "Oh, I heard you're a movie critic. Like, what movies do you recommend?" And I'm like, "What?" Like, what is this? Is this just like what my life <laughs> and is And then now? what you say at Hayden's work <laughs> events is the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Yes. Yeah. I love that so much. <laughs> That's like such an authentic answer. Yeah. It's like also one of the like less political movies that's come out recently. Like mm-hmm. Barbie, I think, is going to be like my favorite, if not like in my top five, definitely for this year. But I feel like I can't recommend that to everyone because it is like it's a little bit divisive. So, but so Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, it is D and D, baby. Yeah, I mean it's a great movie. <laughs> great movie, and I know it's PG thirteen, but I think mm-hmm. for most families, it's probably like a pretty family friendly movie too. Yeah, yeah. If you're okay with violence, because I think that's like the only reason why it's PG-13. And they they say a few bad words, but nothing too terrible. No, I think it's mostly the violence. Because even like the jokes aren't like graphic or like too immature. Like, yeah. Like the only immature joke that I can think of is that Hugh Grant says he's naughty. And I'm like, okay, that's so tame. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like that that would be in a Shrek movie. Like I just think. Yeah, kids would never pick on on that. Yeah. Definitely just oh. the violence. But the violence was good. It was – some of it, like I mentioned, was very like, whoa. Like I can't believe that just happened. But it wasn't yeah. like so bad that I wouldn't think like like an 8 to 12-year-old couldn't handle this movie. Yeah, exactly. So the world really enjoyed this movie. The letterbox average oh, is three wow. and a half. So people agree with you, Courtney. 
the tomato meter and the audience score from Rotten Tomatoes is what gets me. The tomato meter is a 91%. That is like insane. Yeah. And the audience score is well a 93. Movie. Which like that just means people liked it and enjoyed watching it, which is fantastic. I love that. That makes me so happy. The other thing too is I feel like the people who went to watch this movie like kind of cared about it too Mm -hmm. because I don't think a lot of random people went to see this movie. No. 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 I think people saw the title and were like, oh, that's not for me. But I'm here to tell you it is. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm glad they named um, it Dungeons and Dragons too. Like they didn't shy away yeah. from naming it that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is like a slept on 2023 release. And if you haven't seen it already, you need to go watch it. Because I would agree. I was kind of sad that I hadn't seen it already. Because I bet it would have been really good in the theaters. <laughs> yeah. I bet. I bet too. I didn't see it in theaters either, but I bet it was really good. In well, theaters. I read that in the theaters that the cast had a little bit that they put at the beginning of the viewing that was like, hey, like, thank you so much for coming to watch this movie in theaters. Like, mm-hmm. we really appreciate that you're here because this movie was actually made like in 2021 yeah. and kept getting like Pushed. postponed because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The little bit was they're like, we're the on-screen heroes, but you guys are the real life heroes. Cute. I know. Oh, adorable. So cute. All right. Well, I think that wraps up our discussion on Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. And yeah, thank you so much for tuning in. Next week, we're going to be talking about Mean Girls because the new Mean Girls musical is coming out. Um, But we're going to be talking about the original. And we're totally going to help Karen make Fetch happen. Oh, and on Mondays, we wear pink. (laughs) Yes, yes, because that episode <laughs> will come out on Monday. <laughs> I'm very excited to rewatch that movie. It's a, I love that movie so much. It's a good one. Every yeah. time I watch it, I'm like, I remember why I love this. Yeah. Oh, it's such a classic. So be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss it when it comes out. You can find us on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and Google Podcasts. All right. We will see you all next week. Bye, guys. Bye.